Welcome to episode 17 of Move, Crush, Count, a podcast produced by JNL Marketing. If you're a business leader, an entrepreneur, and the marketplace is continuously trying to marginalize or commoditize you, this is the podcast where you learn how to strike back. So just a, a quick thing, at the time of this recording, most of us in the U.S. were staying at home, we're playing it safe with COVID-19, which means the next few episodes that we record, we're going old school podcast style, audio only. Uh, we may work in a few video clips for you as well, put them up on YouTube. Uh, but during these shows at the at some of the iconic venues that we really like to travel to and record at, uh, places like the Bourbon Distilleries, the Muhammad Ali Center, Churchill Downs, those are going to be put on hold for a while until we start opening those venues back up. Today we have a special guest. We are talking with the fixed ops director of the Nilo Group, Tolly Williams. Tolly is an expert when it comes to increasing sales and profit because he's identified what he really sells. So I enjoy talking to people you know, that bring different ideas to the table, especially when they're able to do it with the same time, money, and people, and then increase results. That always grabs my attention, and I hope you'll learn just as much as I did. So let's jump right into the interview, and we'll introduce Tolly. You're listening to Move, Crush, Count, hosted by Scott Joseph. All right, everybody, this is Scott Joseph with Move, Crush, Count. Today, we have a very special guest, the Fixed Ops Director from the Nilo Group, Mr. Tolly Williams himself. Welcome, Tolly. Thank you, Scott, for the invite. Super excited for what you're doing, and thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Well, I want to get everybody up to speed. And so a lot of people from our audience are business leaders. They're outside of auto. I want them to get a quick understanding of what your background is and your experience. And then we're going to dive in because you have a very specific way of doing business. And I think there's a lot of people, regardless of the industry they're in, that they're going to be able to listen to this episode and think, huh, what am I really selling here? And, and apply it and, and, and hopefully improve what they're currently doing. So give me a little bit of your background and your experience. Bring us up to speed on that real quick. I'd love to. I, it started off as I was in high school and, you know, and I needed a job and I started working at an independent garage up in Lake Tahoe, California, in Nevada, and uh, led to me doing an ASEP program through the General Motors program and working, started working at a dealership, owned my own repair facility for about 15, 16 years. Uh, and then got back into the automotive world, and I've worked for three dealer groups since then. Um, and you know, I'm, you know, I worked for um, in San Jose, California, for most of my career in the dealership group. And now I'm so fortunate to work for the Nilo Company up in Sacramento, California, and we're on our 99th year in business. All right, so you actually own auto repair businesses prior to that. I, I was unaware I, of I that. That's facility. outstanding. Yeah, I had a, I had an out, I had an independent garage. Yep. And we had uh, up to eight techs and I had uh, 23 tow trucks. All right. So let me ask you this. Did you have any formal training or was it all on the job? It's all on the job back then. You know, yeah. I've learned a lot. <laughs> so what if, what if, how, cause that's somewhat of a reverse order. And so talk to me about how that has helped you with your current position. I, I think it does. Cause I think when you look at service managers or service directors, and in, in, in dealerships is that they are normally glorified and no offense to anybody, service advisors that do an unbelievable job managing customers and taking care of um, employee conflicts. And honestly, that's probably 99% of our job. And I think that, you know, when you're a business person, you also think about cash, you think about expenses, you think about income and you think about marketing and you think about everything else involves a business. And I think when you look at, uh, a lot of a lot of service managers, they always have their expertise. I mean, I know some service managers that are unbelievable marketers. And then I know some service managers that are unbelievable, I would say, you know, team builders. And they, you know, they build that culture like, wow, God, you are so good at that. Um, and then you have some people that they couldn't, they couldn't market if they're, you know, if their life depended on it. Um, so I think that what brings aspect to me is that, you know, I've owned a business before, successful, sold it. And, um, and I think that brings a little different av avenue to becoming a service director, service manager, because I, I, we, we are businessmen. We do run a business, you know, and, right. and we are there for our customers. So let me ask you this. And, and one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on is because you've got a different philosophy than most service managers. So first, let's talk about, before we jump into what 
your philosophy is and your strategy, let's educate everybody that's not in auto. What is the norm in terms of how people operate or what most service managers might focus on? Um, I think the surface on, you know, as, as you know, you have dealers and like, how much money are you going to do this month? Uh, how much gross and hours per row and, 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 you know, how much money are you going to make me today? Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not into that at all. Um, you know, I, you know, as I, I get in trouble a lot is I, I don't, I'm not worried about the money. I worry about, you know, tracking of my capacity. And I think that when you look at stores that are the traditional way, they're still going after that. You know, how do we hammer our customers to death? And I believe, and I think this is in any business, is that we're in the repeat and referral business. A grocery store, repeating referral. You know, a hardware store. I mean, look at poor little Ace store. If he doesn't have repeat referral, he's not going to make it. And dealerships, especially repeat and referral business is what we're all about. And are you really in that business? Or are you in the business of, you know, tear everybody's heads off and hope I get some more tomorrow? And I believe that that's not the business to be in. Yeah, I would agree 100%. So talk to me, how does your philosophy differ? Because this is what I want people to really focus in on. Well, thank you. So I believe we sell one thing and one thing only, and we sell hours. And we have a infinite amount of hours in our store. So you look at your, an, an average store has, say, 10 technicians. And those 10 technicians can only produce X amount of hours per day. And what we want to do is set a goal per day per technician. So we know if we're selling our capacity. It's kind of like airplane seats. Can we sell airplane seats after the cars, after the airplane is taken off? No, we can't sell those. And I can't sell yesterday's hours. So what I want to do is I want to build a forecast on a daily basis and then hold my technicians and my service advisors accountable to those hours. Now, there is rollovers and so forth like that, but it all equals out in a minute. But here's how we do it. Let's look at a one day month. Every technician is worth nine hours. Some brands, I think 10 hours is the number. And let's use 10 hours for easy math. And I have 10 technicians and they work one day a month. It would be 10 times 10, 1,000 hours. 100 hours, excuse me, 100 hours. 100 hours. If I have two advisors, I divide two divided by 10. A uh, hundred, and guess what? They each have 50 hours to sell every day. And I say, how can we sell those 50 hours? So tomorrow, when I look at what happened yesterday, did we sell 50 hours? Well, I only sold 30 hours. Okay, what happened to the other 20 hours? I don't know. Well, let's find out. Is it because we have no work? Is it because the technicians are slow? Is it because of parts holds or something of that nature? But we want to focus really on what we actually sell. We don't really sell parts too much, but we really sell our technicians' time. And that's what I focus on the most from my parts department to help us make sure we do that. Without parts, we cannot sell ours. And to our service advisors and service managers. And so it's, it's interesting. And the reason that I wanted to bring you on on this is not only to help other auto dealers, fixed ops, manage, you know, fixed ops directors and such, but if I'm in another industry, it really comes down to what am I selling? Right. And, I, and I remember an episode we did with... Uh, the CEO or the president of Petro Oil Company, and that's Arnold Gosita. And he gave a good analogy. He gave a story of a person that uh, from another company, and it, it was a CEO. It was a new CEO that took over this company. Uh, first day on the job, he brought everybody in and asked them, what do we sell? And they were saying, well, we sell drill bits. I don't know if you heard that that interview. And I thought, Huh. All right. So he goes on and on. And the guy's like, you know, he's asking all around, what do you think we sell? And, and so clearly everyone's giving a slightly different version of the drill bit. Well, we sell this type of drill bit and this type of drill and all this other stuff. And he goes, well, we're going to be out of business here in a few months. And, and everyone's like, you know, shocked or whatever. And he goes, because no one knows here what we sell. We sell holes. <laughs> He goes, and as soon as someone else figures out a better way to make a hole, we're out of business. And so it's a very similar thing to you because it breaks it down very simpler. And sometimes we get so into the weeds as business leaders that we forget what are we really trying to accomplish here? What are we really selling? I agree because, you know, what happens is, is that you have a service manager or a dealer and you no know, offense to anybody, please, but they're out there like hours per row and you need to sell five hours per row. And, and I'm looking at is that, 
if we're truly in the repeat referral business, as this guy that's drilling holes is, he, I mean, he, he wants every customer to come back to him, okay. is that, you know, are we treating our customers as we would treat our family members? And if we sit there and have the hammer, 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 what's going to happen is you're going to lose customers. And in turn, what happens? We don't sell any hours. And I feel that if you look at a store and our technicians, there's enough on the car that breaks. God bless America, right? They don't build a perfect car. God bless America. And I think that we have enough to sell a customer by just doing the right thing. And if we do the right thing, what happens? We increase our customer base and actually we'll get super busy. And you look at stores that have great culture and you look at stores that do a great job with their customers that truly trust them, their retention numbers go up. And what happens is, is that their shops are busy because they don't need to oversell anybody. And we're down to the focus is exactly what you said. We're not in the weeds. We're at the big picture is, are we selling our capacity today? Do I care if it's customer pay or internal or whatever? No, I do care about retention though, but I care about selling the capacity of that shop. And if everybody at your store is focused on one thing, and one thing is, of course, we want to have good customer service, but really it's focused on selling those hours. Parts department, service advisors, service managers, parts managers, porters, team leads, foremans are all focused on hours um, per forecast. And the reason they're focused on it is their pay plan is determined upon it. So one is that I'm getting people focused on it because they need to be, but also after they realize, wow, that's a great idea. I only have to focus on one thing, not 400 things. Because if you ever read some people's pay plans, it can be like five pages long. <laughs> um, I could figure out my pay plan on a calculator. It's funny, after uh, you, you start off a business, uh, and, and you, if you go back to the days when you started yours, right? The pay plan is so simple and everything's thriving. The business is growing. And as the business grows, all of a sudden we keep plugging this hole or trying to incentivize here. And by the end of it, after five or six years, the thing's 10 pages long and no one knows how, to, how they're making money. I, and you know, and, and that's the bad part about it, isn't it? I think so, simpler is better. I mean, I, if, if you don't understand your pay plan, you have a serious problem. Well, we're trying to fix this and we're trying to fix that. And it says, well, step back, step back a little. Let's just fix the biggest focus that we want to focus on. I don't need to focus on 4,000 different things. Like, you know, how many flushes are you going to sell? Ugh, I am not a flusher. Sorry, no offense to anybody. You know, I am about what I would sell my family members. I would sell you, Scott. I, that's what I want to focus on. And, you know, there's plenty of work there for that. You don't need to have all these weeds because if you monitor those things and then if you show your employees how well they're doing, I think showing them on a daily basis on what happened yesterday drives results. Like I always talk about green days. It's green, yellow, red for us. And is it a green explain, day yesterday? Explain yesterday, that. Explain what you're talking about there. Great, great question. So if we sell our capacity of hours today, that's a green day. So today we were, yes, today or yesterday, we sold, uh, was a red day, but we were only off 46 hours. And I think this environment, I'm, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to color it green, but I'm going to say that's almost a win. But you know what? We had a lot of stores in our group that were green. We had a great green day and those are wins. Those are wins for us. And I want everybody to have a win day if we can. So what we want to do is we want to look at every technician and every service advisor and every department is, did you have a green day today? And let's celebrate those ones. Cause you know what I feel we do? Managers, what do they do? They like to criticize everybody. I, I'm, a, I'm a happy person. I want to, I want to celebrate wins, not loses. I mean, we know we have to bring people on the back sometimes and have a talk, but you know what? There is so much more you can do with a positive outlook and show them how to win because you know, if they win, they make money. Well, you clearly you bring good energy. It works. A little bit on this red, yellow, uh, and green. Yes. So I'm assuming someone at your level, right? You've got, you're managing, you're responsible for the performance of all the stores. So you're right. sitting there, you probably just want to know, all right, is it red, yellow, or green? And if it's green, you move on with your day. If it's no, red, no. If, tell me, walk me through, walk <laughs> me through you. your day. <laughs> So uh, as a lot of service managers, we're, we're data freaks. And uh, so I believe in that. Um, what I do is I download the data every morning. And what I'm looking for is I monitor all my technicians. I monitor all my service advisors. And I monitor my hours forecast. 
I do have grosses in there because I want them to figure out their pay plans. So here's my question to that. So you're breaking it down per tech. Yes. So are you holding your service managers responsible to look at it at that level? In other oh, words, no. or are you looking at it? You're looking at the whole thing all the way across the board. Whole across the board. And okay. I want to, I'm going to broadcast that out to the technician and to okay. the service advisor and to the parts manager and to the counterparts people. And as we are putting TVs in our, in our, uh, serve in our in our um, shops that we're going to broadcast a ranking report every day of what happened yesterday. I mean, I think good news is powerful. I think that if we talk about how great we did every day, and if we do have a stumble, which we know happens, it's just it's just part of the job that we like. Oh, we got to make up for tomorrow and have that win tomorrow, yeah. because those are wins. So every technician, every service advisor every parts manager, every service manager, every general manager, right? Every day know if there's a green day or a yellow or red day. And the yellows are in the 90s. And, and I want to look at and see that then they can go out and I want them to hug. We can't hug anymore, but I want them to say, you know, great job, right? Because great and, jobs win and don't cost us anything. So let me ask you this. So, and more importantly than all this, another lesson here is you've got a lot of transparency here. Yes which probably helps you from an accountability standpoint. It does, 100%. So, how, and I, I think that when you own the forecast and when you own the forecast at the store level, so it's not Tully's force, forecast. It can't be, it doesn't work. It is my parts and service manager's forecast okay. working with their technicians, their foremans and everybody else. So when they give me the forecast, I'm gonna sell you know, 2000 hours this month. There is a method behind it. I mark out how many days my technician works. I times it by nine or 10 hours and voila, I have the forecast. Now I allow them to modify that forecast through the month for certain things. Training, we want training. I want training. Um, emergencies, understand. Vacations, understand. One day sick, no. Two days sick or more, yes. Um, and so, because now if you believe the forecast, it's not like, oh, that's a Tully's forecast is trying to screw us every day. I want that's the forecast because I believe in the forecast and we know we can make our forecast. And when we look at our stores today, even before COVID and after COVID, is that our forecast gets adjusted for the amount of techs that are we furloughed or working part days. Like, you know, we have a lot of people on three or four day shifts is that our forecast adjusts for that. So we still are driving for are great green days. Because it's irrelevant if you have one tech or 5,000 techs, the forecast is still the same and it's still figured out the same way. So then we can go out and celebrate the wins. So what percentage of dealers do you feel like have this as their focus from the fixed op side compared to what you would say is the norm? I would say, I hate to say, I, I think it's less than 5%. I think that when you look at a store, you'll have service managers who go, you know, that's, that, that's, you know, tell you, I think, you know, we do sell hours, but you know, you know, our pay plan works. And, um, or, you know, my dealer wants me to, you know, sell gross um, or, or, or. And I think that humans hate to change. We all know this. And when you come in, as I came into the Nilo company and I changed everybody's pay plan and, and convinced them that this was a great way, do they embrace it with open arms? No. So I had to prove to them that it works. So my goal was for the first three months is hugs and kisses and let me show you a better way to manage your day service advisor, how to manage your day technician, how to manage your day service manager, instead of like, you know, how much grows, how, how can, can I turn the lights off today to save four cents so my dealer doesn't get mad at me? Does that really work? No, I'd rather have you produce an extra hour and make $160 an hour gross profit parts and labor gross on that one technician's hour than try to turn off a light switch and save four cents. So let, let, you brought up another thing. And I think with COVID going on right now, I think there's probably the chance of a lot of changes that are going to happen post COVID. Yep. Uh, I think dealers right now are reassessing the organization charts. They're sitting there saying, Right now we're doing this with this many people and or they're seeing responsibilities even shift based on what's gonna be required. Walk us through because you are 100% right. People hate change, right? But you navigated, a, if, if less than 5% of dealers are doing 
or have the philosophy that you have in that structure. That means it's a huge change to go from where they were to what you did. Talk to us about, listen, every business leader knows all the, the problems that come about with change in pay plans. We've all dealt with them. But I want to hear specifically some of the things that worked really well or helped you navigate that to where it worked out long term for you. Great question. I believe if you're changing pay plans is I want the person I'm changing the pay plan asking to be changed. Now, that is a task. I don't expect everybody to do that. But what I do do is that if I come into and it's not like an emergency pay change or some stupid thing. If I'm planning to change is what I go into a store and I usually find a successful store like we had we had, you know, I think 13 stores at the time is we go into the store, I find the best store, I find a store that's more open, usually younger, you know, ready to rock and roll. And I go in and say, you know, what? I, I want to change some things up, but I'm going to do it side by side. And I'm going to show you how to be better at your job and make your life easier. And you're going, Tully, I, I don't know how to figure out my pay plan. I mean, I look at this number and I know they take some money off or something and then I get paid. And I say, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to be 100% transparent. You can go to our website and look at how much gross and hours you're doing. I want you to look at that. I want you to times it by the percentage that we're going to pay you. And there's your number. And the check needs to match 100%. And I think that when I show them like, oh, I don't need to worry about selling that. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about that. I just need to worry about one thing. Well, I say two things, making sure we do We treat our customers right. But secondly, is that sell my capacity of hours. And do I, am I shoving customer pay down people's throats? No, because here's the deal. Warranties, customer pay, right? It's just a warranty is paying the bill for the customer, you know, internal is based off of the used car market. So who cares? And PDIs are free money. So it really comes down to customer pay is warranty and CP is really the same thing. And your highest margin is warranty. So I don't know why everybody thinks that's a horrible thing. But if you don't worry about that and worry about the hours piece. So now when I go to a service writer and say, you know, dude, I'm here to help you make it easier. Let's work on selling your capacity. And here's the thing is you've got to make it reasonable. So I believe how many technicians per writer should it be? Three. Why do I say three? If you use 10 hours per day, it's 30 hours per day they need to sell their entire career. And some guys, oh, 30 hours is no problem. I'm saying 30 hours every day of your life. That's a task. So if you have a method, so they say, I'm not gonna overload you so you can't make your bonus, or I'm not gonna underload you so you can't make any money either, but if I have a ratio of three to one-ish as a guide, I'm here to help you sell your 30 hours a day. And let me tell you how to help you sell that. And then you go into tech recs and all these other things, right? But the focus is the hours. I, honestly, I usually have like a 95% rate of acceptance. You're always going to have the naysayers. And then I have to go in there and I sit with them. I'll call their wives or husbands. You know, I do whatever it takes, right? And try to explain that. Because if you don't explain a pay plan right, no matter what business you're in, you're doomed for failure. And I want it to be successful. The hardest one is changing the pay plan for your parts counter people. Because they have never thought that they should have to do anything with fixed ops or I mean for the service department. And it is a challenge. And I am up to that challenge and I have all of mine changed over. Now that was not an easy task. And I had a lot of kissing to do, but I got it handled. <laughs> so you if I'm hearing you right, all right, you're obviously educating them on the plan very well. Massive. training and working with them to demonstrate the success. Did I hear you right? Yes or no on, uh, did you have an overlap period where you were doing side by side comparisons? Yes. So what I like to do first is I like to do it where I don't have two pay plans. I tell them, this is the pay plan we're going to do for you. And I'm going to compare it to what you've done in the past. And let's sit there and say, Hey, let's just do it as this month. And usually, Unless you have an underlying, I have to make a pay cut, worst thing you can ever do, by the way. But if you have to, it is what it is. But if you don't, you have to prove that your plan works. And if your plan is giving them a pay cut and it wasn't intention, shame on you. You didn't do your homework right. So I think that when you go to them and say, okay, you sold this and my pay plan rewarded you because you sold your capacity. Two is you hold your margin. So you're not giving it all the way, right? You should be rewarded. And sure. they're like, wow, tell you, I love that because you tell me every day how I'm doing. You tell me every day what my forecast is. You tell me every day 
what my gross projection is. So guess what they get to do every day? You know, there's four boxes in my pay plan, 110, 190, and you suck, right? And underneath that is a percentage of gross profit of parts and labor gross that they write. And they just times it by the number and guess what they have? Pay plan, done. And, and then, wow, Tully, I can figure out my own pay plan. That's exactly what I want you to do. Every day if you want to. So let me ask you, who, let, let's talk actual results. So if people are switching to it, then obviously the techs are seeing that they're making more money with it. Correct. But as a company, talk to us about the actual results. So you said earlier that most people, it's all about how much money am I got coming in and all this. So in the end, a general manager, a dealer, uh, the business owner, right? In the end, it's, it's going to come down to that as well. Are they more profitable this way? Talk to us about why this has worked out better or give us some, some numbers. Great question. So the biggest thing is how do we figure out our forecast every year? Uh, I call it a calculator forecast. Okay, I did 1 million times 110%. Uh, oh, that's your new forecast. And I'm going, so how does that work? Do I, do I raise labor up 110% or whatever? So I believe that my forecasts are down to the penny. Because if we look at historical averages, which we need to, is what I want to say is that if my shop has a underlying expense of blank, Okay, we have fixed expense and semi-fixed expense that are basically the same, right? And I look at percentage of gross. I don't look at the dollar amount because that's a, it's irrelevant. And then you have, um, you want to make sure that you pay your people right, right? And there's a percent of gross, that number that you need to chase. Totally understand because there's a mathematic equation to get a net at the bottom because we are in business to make a profit. We're not the Red Cross. We are a for-profit company. So now... I want to figure out how many hours I need to sell in order to make a profit for one and also to forecast my year out to see if it works. And if I sell hundred percent of my capacity. So if I sell hundred percent of my capacity and we'll use an example for the needle company, the average parts, the average hour for parts and labor gross is 166. We're in California. So we have high rates, 166 in gross profit. Now, if I know my capacity for my store, is a thousand hours or 2000 hours. I go 2000 times 166. And if I'm above or below that number, what happened? My margin changed. And how often does margin really change a lot? It changes slightly, unless there's some weird thing that you're doing, right? So now when we're looking at a store and a, and a guy comes to me and says, tell you know, they, they expect me to get 600,000 out. Oh, 600, great number. I don't know if that's a good number or a bad number, because if you tell me today, Tully, I did 4 million. Oh, is that a good number? I did a trillion. Is that a good number? Did you sell your capacity today? That's a real number. And now if I know the gross profit, and if I have a nut to crack of 600, guess what I'm going to do? 600 divided by 166 equals the number of hours I need to sell, divide that by the number of days, and now you get to tell the dealer if he's on drugs or not. Because, you know, it, it realistically, you only got so many stalls. Do I need double shifts or two shifts? Or do I really know my capacity of my store and I'm underperforming? And that's the key issue where you look at some stores, and we had challenges at Needle when I came in, is that we have some stores that are underperforming because you know, they think 70% of their efficiency is a good number. I believe 100% of efficiency is the number. I think 110 is great. And I think that, you know, I think technicians don't want to work for 70%. I think they want to work for 100% or 120%. So I think that when you start getting your stores up to 100%, you'll look at your capacity. And now when you go say, I'm adding a technician, what does that mean? 189 hours times 166 delivers blank gross to your store. I'm going to pay out, you know, 11% or whatever in rider gross. Boom. Guess what happens? That's how much money you're going to have. So now when I do a forecast for my year or for my month, I am, I'm down to the cent. If I hit 100% or if I have a store that's normally 110%, I know exactly the gross profit I should be able to generate from that store and see if the store is profitable because, you know, as you know, I get in these, you know, I don't get in these arguments. I get in these discussions about totally we need to save expense. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not a back into, back into a profit guy. I'm a make a profit guy. And the way you make a profit is I'm not going to worry about a goddamn screw for four cents. I'm worried about an hour. That's $166 an hour. That's how you make a profit. Yeah. So let me ask you, you brought up capacity, right? Let's yes. say you got a store operating in the green, all right, consistently. Uh, and you, you say 
they're at full capacity. You brought up for, you know, one shift, two shifts, things like that. Does your focus on, because every business owner wants to keep improving. So when you're at full capacity, then I assume, and maybe you can walk us through this, that your focus then becomes on, all right, how do we become more efficient to, Correct to answer. increase yeah, the capacity? Because if your store is running at 130%, you know, Subaru stores, you know, some of these stores are just machines. God bless America, right? Mm -hmm. And you can only get so many hours out of a technician. So now the step's going to be is that how, if I'm getting, and I'm just going to make up this great example, all my technicians are working at 150%. Okay, this is probably never going to happen, but I'm going to say as an example, and you only have 10 stalls at 150%, can you increase gross profit at your store? I say no, unless you're gonna hire less qualified people. I believe paying less doesn't work. So how do you grow your store? You're gonna grow your store by multiple shifts, uh, night shift, do I build another building? And then when you build another building, guess what I have? You put 10 stalls in there. If I can produce you know, 10 stalls worth of hours, I can tell you how much gross that store can do. So when you're making an educated decision on growing a store, now we can actually see if it's going to make sense or not, because, you know, I think a lot of times is that these manufacturers demand us make Taj Mahals, which yeah. nobody wants to come to, by the way. Yeah. And, and we build a Taj Mahal and our rent factor now is 4 million percent is how does that work? Or you need to have 30 stalls and you're going, I, I only have five techs. I don't care. Well, <laughs> it doesn't pencil out because it's not going to happen. Now, you can grow into it. God bless America. But I think that you have a mathematic equation to look at as you expand and as if you're a max capacity, what's my next option? Is it night shifts? Is it take your recon off site and gain those stalls? I love that part where say you have your customer pay and warranty there and you're full, every stall, every corner has a rack or lift in it. You're working on the floor, God bless America. And you still have more customers and you're back out three weeks. Where do we find stalls? Can I go and rent stalls a mile or two away and do my recon and PDIs there? Because if I can take two stalls away from my main shop and I can get $30,000 in parts labor goes, guess what I just generated? Another 60K by going out and finding a place I need to do to do my recon and PDI, which probably doesn't need to have a customer facing place. So I think when you're looking at how do I expand is, we gotta think, right? But we're gonna think with numbers to make sure we make the right decisions. Well, and great point. Everything's got to be driven by data. And I and it's always issues or challenges or problems, whatever someone wants to use, whatever word someone wants to use, they're always more enjoyable once you're coming from a challenge of, wow, we're at capacity, we're a little over capacity here. How do we find more? How do we get more versus we're selling at 50%? Those are, those are the problems that suck. It does. And, and look at, look at, look at COVID-19. I think that that's exactly your point is that, you know, all of a sudden we had, you know, we were booked out a week and now we can't, you know, generate 20 appointments and we're used to having 50. Right. And, you know, what do you do? Well, I believe we still want a green day. So we have two things. One is that we furlough technicians. Okay. You know, if you have to, you have to, but your goal is let's bring them all together as a team. If you have a great culture at your store is that let's do like maybe everybody works three days and you, you're open six days a week, three and threes, or what, what can you do to bring this stuff together? Because, Normally technicians are a good tight group. And if your service manager or your foreman that runs the store is really good at your store, it all works out. So we had, to, we furloughed very little technicians, but we kept them all employed, right? And now we're still going after green days because instead of having 30 techs working every day, maybe I'm now gonna have 15 techs every day and I can still go after what? I can still chase my hours forecast. We know a forecast what's gonna happen in these tough times. So then we can make our decisions, what we have to do at our, at, at, you know, at a business level. Cause we know that, you know, unfortunately we're going to lose some money right now, but we can know and manage and, and know what's happening because we have a great way of forecasting our dollars and, and we can back into numbers as we go down and we can go up. So when we say I have four stalls over there, well, those technicians need two stalls. So do they produce 30,000, $60,000 that one tech? Well, no, he only produces 30. So why does he need an extra stall when I know I have appointments out a month or two weeks? How can I help him? Maybe I can hire a pusher or hire him a guy at minimum wage to park the car and be his little buddy. And I can get another tech in there producing nine hours or 10 hours a day, which in, in essence will make us another $30,000 in gross profit. And that's how you got to think at your store. Yeah. And it goes back to the question you asked in the very beginning was, 
what makes us different as service managers and non-service managers is because I have a businessy background because I ran my own company. I'm thinking, how do I expand? How do I expand? How do I grow? How do I, how do I make a profit? How do I, that's the difference between a service manager that is a great service writer and God bless every one of those people or a person that is a great people person, but also is thinking, how do I grow my company? Because that's like your, that's, that's like your entrepreneur of your dealership or, or, or your, of your dealer and your GM. They're thinking, how do I get another dollar? How do I get another dollar? But let's think of it mathematically. Yeah. And so how is this, first off, where in the heck did you get the idea from? And then how has it evolved over the years? Great question. So I'll give all the credit out. Uh, you know, I just want to say I was a grocer uh, and I, 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 I apologize. Um, you know, I was after the gross, the gross, the gross, the gross. And there's a video of me making, you know, a complete fool of myself. But Randy and Kim Brinkman, which are trainers out there, uh, probably a good, I mean, it's got to be almost 20 years, I think, 15, 20 years, came out to me one day and they came to our group when I was working in uh, DG, DG, DG in San Jose. And they were doing a uh, training facility for all of our stores. And um, he was talking about service and, you know, and, you know, of course, you know, I'm not the quietest person on the planet. And uh, we, uh, we got into a little tango and, you know, and stuff like that. And then, you know, it took me probably four hours and he showed a couple slides. And because I'm a math freak, I'm like, you know, dude, I think you're right. <laughs> you know, and, and I took it from there. And then my goal was, is that if you believe in the hours, how do I break it down to my employees or my team members believe in hours? And I think that's where I refined it down to where is I believe in the concept that the Brinkman's brought up to me, God bless America. But now how do I make it fit a store or a cookie cutter, any store to where I get my managers and I get my parts people, I get my team leads, I get my technicians. And of course my service advisors all believing in that process. And then it can be monitored on a daily basis, not a weekly or monthly basis, but a daily basis. So let, let's talk about how you, your group is adjusting uh, to the COVID situation, the, to the virus. Um, what are you doing right now to protect your employees and your customers? Great question. You know, I, you know, I, a lot of us are doing the same thing as first is that, you know, the social distancing, that I think is the biggest thing. Um, you know, unfortunately we did have to furlough some, some staff to break it down to where we needed to. We tried to make it where if we could get everybody to work it out at the store level, but we do have a business to run. So when it comes to sales, of course, they got, they got furloughed because of the, uh, you know, the mandate on that. Yep. But when it came to service side, uh, we did furlough a couple technicians, not a lot. We really worked hard on that. We had some service advisors that we had to furlough based off the number of hours because, you know, it's really, it's got to boil down to, you know, three techs per day per writer. So we had to do the math on that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that pace was in play so we could everybody that can make, you know, make a living and, um, we can justify it. And then the next thing is, is that how do we keep people safe and how do we work in that? So, you know, social distancing, we put tape on the walls, you know, on the floors about staying back. We keep everybody in the car. Uh, don't bring them in in the waiting room. The waiting room is completely removed and scattered around. You know, of course, we're cleaning on a we, you know, an hourly, if not more than that basis. And two is that we're also sanitizing the car. So we use a product called Drive Pure at our store. And it's a chemical that is not, not really a chemical, it's a, it's a process that hospitals and everybody's been using for years. So it's not one of these, I, know, I invented it yesterday because of the virus, is that it kills the virus in it, uh, which we love. So we are giving that away for free to our customers. And of course, we offer pickup and delivery because people are scared. They should be scared. I would yeah. be scared. Yeah. So we are really trying to work on the message. And this is really, really cool to our marketing department, Summer here, is we're here to help. That's it. We're here so to help. Yeah, I'm not here to tell you anything. I'm here to help you. If you it's need an it. empathy approach. Which, Correct. Yeah. And which we do that for the last three or four weeks. And yep. now as we come out of it, we're here to help you get back to work. I'm not here to sell you anything. Of course we are, but I mean, that's not the message. The message is, is that the needles have been here for almost a hundred years. We're here for another hundred years and we're here to help you in our community. So I think that if you have that approach, making sure you're doing all the right things to keep people safe with social distancing, sanitations, and all those things and reassurance is that we're going to get through this thing. And I think you said it earlier on this thing is that as we come out of it, is our company going to change? Absolutely. It's going to change. Yeah. And I think it's going to change for the better because we're going to get a little bit leaner. I think we're going to learn things that we didn't know. And another thing is that we're going to learn that what software works better because, you know, a lot of times when you're busy, Guess what you do with your software? Yeah, yeah, I'll work on it later. I, I, I don't use that part. I don't need that. 
I'm paying $4 million a month for that. I don't need it. I don't need it. So all of a sudden, guess what you're doing? Like, what can you do for us? You know, and we have great partners with, you know, a lot of vendors out there. And you're like, uh, what can you do for us? And how can you help us? And they're there to help. So, you know, God bless our vendors. And, and my question always has been, is what can your software do for you? And you need to ask and demand it. And, and you know what? They're there to help. And they want to help you, you know, nine times out of ten. You don't want to have the old Blu-ray where all you did was hit the eject and the play and stop. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, it, it's got all these other features. But uh, I'm glad you went into the marketing because so you brought up a lot of specifics of things that you're doing to help protect everyone. And so and I love the empathy approach. I've been talking about that for a while now. I, I think that's the way to go. How are you communicating the safety aspect? And the reason I ask that is this dealers have struggled for a long time in their marketing trying to find a way to communicate how they're different or how they're unique or better safety and the trust before trust was always about can i trust them to fix my car can i trust that when i go there i'm getting i'm only paying for what i actually need to get done i'll relate it to service um and or and am i paying the right price for that right well now there's another element of trust. Can I trust that this transaction is going to be safe for me? Right. And so I, I think as we market ourselves, communicating the things that you're doing is going to be equally as important as the price and the convenience and, and everything else that we used to market. Yeah, I agree. I think that when you look at trust and this is what it's really all about is that, you know, we have been, we are very blessed with a company that's on its 99th year. So the Nilos have been in the Sacramento forever and ever, and they have a great name for themselves. So we are already one leap ahead of everybody else. And I think the next thing is, is that, is that your marketing pitch is great. I mean, we, we do a lot of social media um, on this, in this scenario is we're here to help, you know, we're, we're keeping ourselves clean. We're doing the social distancing, you know, it, it, and you look at some of these people they are making these exotic videos of like, you know, are you really trying to prove us that you're actually trying to do that? Is that I think simpler is better. I think a simple message, we're here to help. We are cleaning, we, you know, we have social distancing. I don't have a 14 paragraph thing of, you know, everything I'm doing every five minutes. Because if the customer doesn't trust you, they're not gonna trust you even then, even worse. And I think that when they come into our store, they see the actions, one, we have to, we have to say what we're doing. Two Correct. is that they already trust you. And I believe that, you know, that if they trust and your service riders are saying, yeah, we're cleaning up and we're trying to keep you safe and, oh, make sure you stay in the car. You know, Mrs. Smith will be right with you. Just want to make sure you're safe out there or we're going to come and pick up and delivery your pick up your car. That's a big deal. And I think as this week, especially, we're seeing the ramp up from this week and you know, last week. And then this week, we're getting a little bit more, and a little bit more. And as I think people are getting a little bit more secure you know, humans forget. Um, and I think our message is, is that we're taking care of your car and we're taking care of you. And I think we're getting that trust factor. A lot of people scared, hundred percent, but I think we're getting the message out where we can do it safely and, and, and properly. And I think that message is working. I think you hit the nail on the head with actions. So I, I think you have to demonstrate, I think that's going to be even more important. I'll give you an a, a scenario that, I, that happened to me last week. So first off, I am not one of these guys that walks around. I don't want to catch it, but I'm a healthy guy. I, I feel like if I did, I'd probably be one of the 99% that made it. Yeah. All right. Um, so I don't walk around in fear of it, but I'm doing my social distancing because if I am, if I do have it and I don't react to it in a bad way, I don't want to pass it to people unknowing. Right. I go, so we're in restaurants here or either takeout uh, or, or drive through. So those are the only restaurants we're allowed to use here in, in Louisville. So go up the street and I'm doing a drive through one restaurant and I drive through and get to the window. The guy's sweating. All right. So initially, you know, my first impression is uh, <laughs> it's not great. So I'm watching him sweat, no gloves. He's handling my money. He's getting the food, he's passing it. I'm seeing him go through doors, touching doors, doing all these things. And so I'm like grabbing the bag, getting it in the car. <laughs> Keep the change, buddy. I don't, you know, and I'm, I'm not a panicker, 
But when I got home, I, I was wiping everything because I mean, like I'm a, yep. I was nervous about eating that quite honestly. And so same week I go to another place, does not have a drive through. I get to the door and they've got a number that I can call. I place my order. They take my credit card by phone. There's no touching of money or card. This was a place where normally the, the takeout would be prepackaged and kind of assembled. All right. They wouldn't do that. So everything was packaged separately, put in a nice thing. They bring it out. They sit it on the ground. There's no human to human touching anything like that. I had a hundred percent confidence. And I think that trust and confidence happened more because of the actions and what I witnessed more than anything else. Uh, and I think especially in the first six to 12 months post when things start to open back up, I think that's going to be critical. Uh, I would totally agree with that. Cause I think what you're trying to get is the actions are the biggest thing. So you can say that we're doing it and the restaurant one, I'm sure was saying that we're clean and we're doing everything right. Well, that's just because that's what they post to say. Correct. But you know, when you got there, like, you know, I, I don't think this is happening. And, you know, restaurant number two is taking it like super serious. And guess what? You're going to go back to that person because that person's truly in the repeat referral business. Correct. Um, the other one is like winging it. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to say it. Taking it super serious versus just kind of going through the motions and winging it. I, I think that's perfect. All right. So let's finish with this. What, what do you think going in post COVID things opening back up? Obviously, the precautions and, and doing all the right things, let's remove that. that. Let's assume and hope every business does that moving forward. But just with how is the business in terms of how you're going to market or how you're going to operate, you know, how do you see that evolving? I believe that coming out of this, we're going to get more customer centric. I think before dealerships like, we're a dealer, you must come and see me. Right. And I think that's the wrong approach. Right. And I think that, you know, when it comes to my hours thing in the shop, it's all going to be the same. But what's going to happen is how are we going to react to our customers and deal with our customers? One, I think pickup and delivery is going to be a biggest thing on the planet. And we are embracing that full force. We do pickup and delivery now, but we're doing it. Every store does it their own thing. So we're going to do something like Paragon Don Honda has. I mean, he's the ultimate proven in that in that. Yeah. Right. And I think that we have right software and stuff like that. Our brands are going to mirror that. So we're going to give the option of what do customers really want? Not to come to a dealership, right? But they need to, and we want them to. We want them to have a great relationship, but do they really need to come to the dealer? I say no. I say, we'll come and get your car. We'll drop a loaner or pick it up and bring it back to you. So when we come out of this, one is, do we need to have 4,000 porters? No. I really have 4,000 drivers picking up cars every day. Yeah. And what I want to do is that one is that I think we're going to be much cleaner store, right? which is a good thing for our health of our employees and customers. And two is that we're going to do what customers are asking for is I don't want to come and wait in the waiting room with stale donuts or go to a Taj Mahal that has a you know barista out there making coffee for you because that's not what they really want. But I'll come to your house or work and pick up your car, do the great service, send you an estimate via text, email, or whatever liking you like with pictures or video, and you're going to say yes or no. You're going to pay for it on the phone, online, and then we're going to drop the car off and pick up the loaner car. What a concept in 2020. <laughs> right? so, you know? let's, reverse, let's reverse your hours for a second, all right? What are you really selling? Hours. What's the customer really buying? They're not buying, hey, I get to go spend a half hour or an hour at the dealership. And by the way, where are most of your stores? In town. No, I mean, what? Part, so the people that don't know where you guys are located, what part of the country? Oh, we're in, we're in uh, sorry, California. Yeah, what part? Oh, Sacramento. All right. The capital. Yep. How's the traffic? Oh, it's crazy. All right. So think about that for a second. If they don't have to mess with that, anymore right so it's not just the time at the store it's also the time getting there and getting back and the hassle that becomes so i i love the direction that's going and i think this is kind of if there is a positive that can come from this um i think consumers are going to be the biggest benefiters from everyone because i think businesses are all going to have to get more customer uh, centric or more focused and, and, and realize what are they really buying? And then how do we deliver that faster, easier, more convenient uh, to them? 
And we compare always to Amazon because, you know, that is the ultimate in easiness, right? And we're like, yes. oh, yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. But you know what? I think today is that a lot of our software actually has a lot of those things in it today. We just chose not to use them or like, or those are for the 1%. And now that I think it's going to flip where I'm hoping my pickup and delivery business, when we talk six months from now, is 50%. Yeah. Because here's the thing about that is that to your point, is do people really want to get up an hour or two early and drive to a dealer and drop their car off? No. Do you want a cattle call at your store every morning at seven o'clock? No. Do we all want to deal with traffic every day? No. So I want to pick up and deliver all my cars midday. I control my driveway. I get a much better customer centric driveway. And also my service riders are not slamming cars out as fast as they can ride up, which is not what we want in the first place. Right. So now we get to control it. And the benefit also is going to be is that our loaner cars, which are the most expensive thing that we have as an asset, right? Is that we spend a fortune on rental cars every year is that our utilization is gonna be much better. Maybe yeah. you don't need a rental car if I pick it up and deliver in the same day. Or if That's I get correct. a rental car, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go get it back tomorrow. Whereas before, sometimes it's hard to get people to come back because they're busy. So yeah. all these efficiencies are gonna help our store, but in turn, the customer is gonna be so much more satisfied with us because they're getting it the way they wanna be. They want the Amazon style. I hit the button, you come and give it to me. Tolly Williams, I gotta thank you for doing this interview. I, if you, I don't care what industry you're in. If you can't sit there and take away and see like, you know what, I can apply something like that. Why, or why aren't we thinking like that? Then you, you might be in the wrong profession. So, you know, this interview, we're doing it COVID style. Normally you and I would be sitting right next to each other. Uh, if you were here in Louisville, we'd either be at a distillery or, or Churchill Downs or something fun like that. If, or, you know, I could come out there and see you, but uh, here we are, we're doing it remote. You know, I call it COVID style on this interview, Zoom. And uh, so we'll release this and uh, hopefully everybody gets a lot out of it and, uh, and benefits the way we want. So Scott, I appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Scott. And uh, I'm going to hold you accountable to do it face to face one day. That's coming, buddy. That's coming. I love talking to you. You're always positive. Thank you so much, Scott, very much. Thank you. Big thanks to Tully Williams for graciously agreeing to do this interview and sharing his knowledge with us today. I want to thank you, the MCC Nation, for tuning in today. Next on Move Crush Count, we are interviewing Seema Dahl. Seema is an expert when it comes to driving sales, attracting top talent, increasing employee retention, and achieving professional goals faster. I want you to do me a favor. Join the Move Crush Count Nation on Facebook and LinkedIn on, on our groups there so you can engage with tons of other business leaders, including the people that we interview. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter so you get instant updates on all the new episodes and interview announcements. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see these interviews live and in person at all these cool locations that we uh, travel to. Uh, we always release the video version of the show exactly one week after the initial launch day. And if you're new to the, the MCC podcast, I want you to visit movecrushcount.com. That's movecrushcount.com. Check us out. You can check out our previous episode uh, with Stephen Mason from Iron City Ford. Did a phenomenal job on leadership and succeeding through a time of crisis. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in today. I am your host, Scott Joseph, and I will see you on our next episode.